things were bad and she was scared But whenever I would cry She'd calm my fears and dry my tears With a rock and roll lullaby And she'd sing sha na 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 It'll be alright sha na 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 John Russell, Rick Hickman with you once again. And John, for fear of boring our next guest, I'm going to read just a portion of his resume <laughs> that in itself is so lengthy it hardly fits on a page. He, of course, has sold more than 70 million records, two platinums, 11 gold records, five Grammy Awards, 15 top 40 hits. That's just a fact that I find unbelievable. Ten top 40 Mm. country charting hits. He became the 60th member of the Grand Old Opry, and he's the only artist ever, John, to have the Song of the Year on the pop, country, and gospel charts. So quite a resume as we welcome B.J. Thomas. Oh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That that all sounds good. (laughs) He's looking around saying, was that really me? (laughs) Did I do all that? I've been been very very fortunate. I've I've had the chance to work with some of the great writers and composers of my time, so I've been very lucky. You started out, uh, you're born in, in uh, Oklahoma, Hugo, Oklahoma, and uh, I got to think you're the most famous thing that came out of Hugo, Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that particular town, although, the, you know, Oklahoma's a great state. I've, actually, I, you know, all my family were native Texans, and uh, I only was in Hugo for a couple of weeks. My grandmother uh, delivered hmm. me, and then we went back to back to Houston. So I grew up in Houston, and, uh, you know, so I've got the Oklahoma roots, but, uh, you know, I feel like uh, a Texan, really. And you grew up a baseball fan. Well, I was, yeah, my brother and I played a lot of baseball, as most kids did, uh, you know, when they were younger, when we were 12, probably 12 till we were about 18. You know, we had aspirations of being uh, a ball players. My brother was a lot better than me, and I, mean, I never could hit the curveball, and so I'm glad <laughs> I, I got into a little band when I was 15, and, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to do, do that. As difficult as it must be for fans to pick a favorite song out of all of your great hits, I know my favorite just happens to be the song that really got you noticed as a singer and got your career career in motion of course i'm speaking of i'm so lonesome i could cry yeah that's a song that actually would be my favorite too did you hear that lonesome weather with his sounds to blue Is wide and low, and I'm so lonesome I could cry. Did you ever see a night so long when time?
was a song my dad my dad asked me to record it so when I we had we had the chance to our little band called the Triumphs we had the chance to make our first album uh, and I put that on there for my for my dad and uh, somehow it found its way on the radio and and uh, and got us started. Of course, the, the great uh, Hank Williams. Uh, in, in your version, what's neat about the cover? I mean, it, you know, it's true to the original, but yet you still got the, the B.J. Thomas uh, a feel to it. So that that's always a little tricky too when you're when you're doing a, a remake of a classic like that. Is uh, you know, you can go one of two ways. You can actually just try to cut it, you know, straight down the middle, or you can try to put yourself yeah. into it a little bit, right? Well, it, you know, it kind of uh, John, it kind of developed over time. I, uh, we did the, we saw the. Uh, the Hank Williams life story, your cheating heart, and uh, my buddy that was also in in, the, in my band said, uh, you know, man, you got to start doing that song. That that was just perfect for you. So we started doing it without the the O's uh, at the end, um, and it then uh, it kind of developed in the, into where I kept singing at the end and kind of put a, 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 a kind of a signature on it. So it developed over a period of months, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm glad it did. Now, obviously, you're you're starting singing from from a young age, I guess, in church in the church choir and all that. So, but how did you uh, take that next step to uh, you know decide to do this uh, for a living? Well, yeah, yeah, I always kind of you know like like this thing, and as you said, but uh, it kind of I think that all the the aspirations and the the later success just came from getting in the little band. That was a very important uh, thing for me. So I, I developed, uh, you know, we all did develop as musicians and singers over a period of years. We made some local records, and uh, just so happened that we we got it we got it right on. I'm so lonesome, and uh, and I'd always had the burning desire to to be a singer, but uh, or to do do something like that. But uh, after we had the first hits, well, then I you know I, I just continued to do it and done it all the way. And then 68 comes along, you get hooked on a feeling, and uh, you strike gold again, got another uh, million-selling hit. I can't stop this feeling deep inside of me. Girl, you just don't realize what you do to me when you hold me in your arms so tight. I got to, I, I went to, I had a buddy of mine by the name of Mark Haynes called me in 67. Uh, I was kind of having a, a low ebb in 67 after having the, you know, the two, three hits in 66. And he said, DJ, you know, they're cutting a lot of hit records up here and I'm writing with the, with the writers now. And, and uh, why don't you come up here and start recording with us? So I, I moved to Memphis and started hanging out at the American Studios. And the band, the, the American Studio group, was just, they were such a great recording band. The first time I sang with them, it was like I was their singer and they were my band. They were just, they were that good and we fit together that well. So I started making some, you know, demos and uh 
doing some sessions with them, and we cut uh, The Eyes of the New York Woman, which kind of got me started. It was uh, uh, like a top 20 hit. And then uh, Mark Haynes wrote Hooked on a Feeling for me, and that really got me back. And then the monster hit. Uh, we're moving to 1969. Uh, uh, raindrops keep falling on my head. It uh, winds up, uh, it's the theme song to, of course, Butch Cassie and the Sundance Kid. Tell us a little bit about the evolution of that song, if you can, BJ. Was that was that going to be a foregone conclusion that that was going to be the theme song to the movie, or how did that all come about? Well, yeah, I think you know it was a, it was a, definitely a part of the score and was going to be a part of the of the movie. And and uh, I understand that Robert Redford really had some objections to it because um, he he just didn't think a full length song fit in the movie. But it turned out that it fit perfectly. Raindrops are falling on my head, and just like the guy whose feet are too big for his bed, nothing seems to fit. Raindrops are falling on my head, they keep falling So I just did me some talking to the sun And I said I didn't like the way he got things done Sleeping on the job, those raindrops are falling on my head Paul Cantor and, and uh, various people began immediately to uh, try to get Burt Bacharach and Hal David to do a session with me. And uh, this was kind of the culmination of that. Uh, I, after I had hooked on a feeling, Mr. Bacharach recognized that I was selling a lot of records and I kind of was in the back of his mind. Although they did pitch Raindrop to, uh, to Bob Dylan and uh, even Ray Stevens. Me and Ray laugh about it all the time. I, was, I, was, I, I always have to shake his hand for turning it down. You know, so, man, you really, you really goofed up. But you know, I think it was a perfect, uh, it was a perfect fit for us. And I, I, uh, they called me, and uh, I flew out to California and uh, rehearsed the song, of course. And I cut it for the the, the soundtrack. And I, and I don't know uh, if you remember Bush Cassidy that well, but it was kind of an art movie, kind of an avant garde, right? kind of kind of movie kind of hidden in a western and so it was just one of those things that a lot of a lot of good things came together then about six weeks later we recut raindrops for the single version and uh you know it really it it it, it was started very slowly in 69 uh, but when the butch cassidy came out in, uh, in the christmas release in 1969 then the raindrops kicked off and just you know, just sold a whole lot of copies. We're talking with B.J. Thomas. He's going to be uh, performing at the uh, Holland Tulip Festival here in uh, just a short time. And, and B.J., your your style has been one that could really meld into a lot of different uh, styles, and obviously you have done that, as Rick was mentioning. I mean, you know, the pop field, yeah. the country field, uh, the, the the gospel field. Was that by design, or I mean, is that just B.J. Thomas being B.J. Thomas? At that time, we were, I was a product of Top 40 Radio, and on the 
on top on the top forty stations, they played every every genre. It, it's you know mm -hmm. whatever was selling records, they played Ray sure. Charles and Montavani and <laughs> Willie Nelson and whatever you know. So everything was on the same station, and so we were kind of a product of that as a as a band when we first started. We would just learn the songs off that top forty chart. So I I, I didn't really purposely try to be do different genres. I was just doing the songs I liked and. Uh, uh, and it just worked out the way it did. So uh, you moved over to gospel music, get, getting back to your roots a little bit. I'm sure this is public knowledge, too. You kind of fell a little bit there, had some, some rough times personally. I think you got to tied up in the rock and roll lifestyle there, and the, the drugs <laughs> and alcohol kind of took over a little bit. Was going to the gospel thing, was that just as much uh, healing your soul as it was uh, you know, making a change in, in your musical direction? Well, you know, I was kind of a product also of uh, my of the society of, of the right. 60s, uh, and uh, so I I had my involvement in uh, in, in drugs and alcohol, and I, my, my dad was, uh, you know, I was kind of raised around alcoholism, and so you know, uh, so that was just something I was going to have to go through. And the and the gospel music was kind of an expression of where I was after I kind of got through that and uh, got free of of, uh, of those things, and then I felt like I wanted to do a, a spiritual record, and I had no idea of the huge uh, you know christian music or gospel music business but i made that uh that first record home where i belong and actually i had the first four platinum albums in gospel music history so i'm very proud of that but uh i didn't know there was such a huge uh, avenue there so when i started it kind of became a lot more than i thought it would but it was a reflection of of how how my life was going at the time, our mm -hmm. life, Gloria, Gloria's and mine. Mm -hmm. You and your wife Gloria have been married for over forty years, and what have all <laughs> those great years of marriage taught B.J. Thomas? And how big a role was she in helping to uh, preserve your career and uh, your life in general? Oh well, I tell you, I'm still in husband school. I'm learning more. <laughs> I'm learning you and the I rest learned, of us. I learned, yeah, I learn something every day, but. Oh, she's a, she's a great girl, and we've been married 42 years now. And uh, she, you know, she we're in love, and we 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 are in love. And she just always could uh, see me for who I was, and not who I was I, I was at the time. And she always could see me for who I could I could be. And uh, and you know, we just uh, we never gave up on each other, and especially on her side, she, she could have uh, you know she had some hard times, but uh, we eventually got through it, and. You know, I, I don't. I don't know if there's any secret to it other than uh, if you if you love one another, that kind of holds you, binds you together. You know. You know, you know, BJ. Now t today, uh, it, it seems like it's almost a a badge of honor, or it's almost like if if you, you you've got to have an alcohol or a drug problem, and you got to go to rehab, <laughs> and that, that becomes that becomes a thing. Now you were you know you were having your difficulties yeah. back before that was in vogue. I mean, you had to actually you know yeah. you, you were fighting for your life. Uh, talk to us about that. How how'd you get how'd you get yourself clean? Well, I was uh, you know I was at a point where uh, I was kind of raised in it, and I thought, well, that's just my destiny. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I'm not going to live past 30 anyway, was the, was our whole idea back in those days. You know, you couldn't trust anyone over 30 sure. or whatever. And we were all just crazy back in those days. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, this, I just felt like, well, that's, this is my faith. I'm, uh, this is what I've got. But, uh, uh, you know, there, there came a time when, uh, you know, we kind of, Gloria and I both kind of realized that there was a, the important part of uh, this whole thing was the spiritual side of it, and uh, we were mostly, uh, and, and me especially, were more devoted to the material uh, side. And you know, I, I remember distinctly when Raindrops went number one, and okay, there you go. Now you finally, you finally did what you, you dream has, has come true. And you know, I, I, I thought, well, you know, I don't feel any better. I'm, I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I so you know, it didn't make, it didn't make me happy. So I know I know there was a. It was kind of a void there that wasn't wasn't filled, and of course I had always had the, that that gospel background, and uh, it it came back around, and uh, and that was the thing that pulled me through. That was the beginning uh, that that kind of got me where I, I you know I put the put down my I just turned and took a different road with Gloria because I had her as you know we were each other's uh, companion, and so we both had a spiritual awakening, and and that was the beginning of of you know, beginning to, to live a real life. 
And then in the 80s, of course, your career takes off all over again in the, the, the field of, of country music. You come back, you have hits like Whatever Happened to Old Fashioned Love and uh, New Look from an Old Lover and uh, Two Car Garage, and, and you, you hit it big again. So you kind of reinvented yourself at least two or three different times. Yeah, you know, I, uh, that, was a, that was a great thing. Uh, I mean, that was a great thing for me, a fortunate thing. One of my best friends back in that time was a guy named Pete Drake, who was uh, uh, the legendary steel guitar player. And he, he said, man, you know, BJ, I, let's go in the studio. And I didn't really know. After I'd been in gospel for a while, I realized that I was not, my, what I wanted to do was not be a, 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 a Christian singer. I mean, I was a singer who was a Christian, but I, did, I didn't want to be a gospel singer or a minister or anything. I still wanted to just sing to everyone. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and at that time, the urban cowboy thing was huge, and so uh, country was the avenue to go, and the, the pop music was kind of in demise then. And really, that whole pop area is not even there anymore that we had back in those days. It, right. It was so good. And anyway, I went in the studio with Pete, and we cut Old Fashioned Love, and, and so it was another thing where we were just... We just look at it like there's two kinds of songs. There's a good song and a bad song, and we just picked the ones we thought were good and, and did those, and, and it worked out. And I, I got to think, uh, BJ, that the cross-section of your audience, I mean, going from, from pop music to gospel music to country music, I mean, it's got to be an interesting uh, blend of uh, people that, that, that find you and, and uh, you know go to BJ uh, Thomas concerts, I guess, right? Well, you know, it really is. Uh, there, there's a uh, cross-section. Some people... Uh, you know, gospel people kind of look at me as a gospel singer, and pop. You know, the old pop fans they they think of me as a pop singer, and then country people they think of me as a as a country th- a singer. So um, it, it's all good in that in that respect. And there is a wide cross section of, of people, and that just makes it fun. You know, also kind of toward the end there, uh, while I was after I had done some country music, I uh, a, a guy wrote a theme song for a television show called Growing Pains and mm-hmm. I did that did that song and that kind of you know was back in the pop field so it, it just makes it all more interesting for me you bet. I believe you uh, you cut that with Jennifer Warrens didn't you I cut, well I cut it as a solo oh. first and then the and then after a couple of years, uh, Jennifer came in and we recut it as a duet. Then uh, a few years after that, you know, they try to change the the theme song just uh, <laughs> sure. right. very very little every now and then to keep it interesting. And so then I I cut it with uh, Dusty Springfield, which was great was a great experience, and she brought a lot of great uh, great vocals to that song. And uh, you know, so it was uh, it probably got more airplay than than anything I've ever done, or at least as much as raindrops. It's uh, everywhere I go. I just got back from Australia, and I, wow. they were running growing pains every day down there. So show me that smile, Ooh, show me that smile. Don't waste another minute on your crying. Schedule like now, BJ. Obviously, you're coming to our neck of the woods here in the near future. I mean, how many uh, how many dates do you uh, tend to work now? Well, you know, it's funny. This, this year, usually in the in the when the politics are are, <laughs> are going are going strong, it, it, the year is, is kind of light. But this year, I, I I might do close to 90 shows this year, so I'm gonna be wow. really busy. And I just got back from a month in Australia, and uh, you know, so we're gonna be quite quite busy this year. So hopefully, I'll see a, see a lot of people out there. Now, are you still are you still recording uh, newer stuff? Working on new uh, new material? Yeah, I, I'm still cutting new things. Uh, I, I just finished a, an album of new songs in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, with Larry Butler and uh, Mike McGuire, uh, the the guy from Shenandoah, and we're uh, they're mixing, fin- doing the final mixes of that now. So we're going to make that available sometime in late summer. And um, you know, actually, we uh, I've had a lot of success down in South America, and so we've actually went in a couple of years ago and did uh, me and some buddies of mine in, in New York. We cut an album of classic Brazilian songs, mm-hmm. so wow. that's also a 
that's also again we kind of just did it for ourselves <laughs> and we put it out and put it out in south america you know all of all the musicians love that bossa nova and brazilian music and of course now we want to we want you to you know we want people here to hear it so but the new th- the new thing will probably be out late this summer is there a website where people can find some of that material and also research your touring schedule and other info? Yeah, Rick, it's on the bjthomas.com. You go there and you can uh, you can access all my stuff. We've got some free free downloads on there, and you know it's a typical website. <laughs> okay, you getting a lot of golf in these days? I am. Uh, I am playing a lot of golf. I'm going to hit the golf ball this afternoon, and uh, I just feel better when I get out and get some sun and hang out with my buddies, hang out with people that just treat me treat me like a regular guy, you know? Sure. The, the one thing I wanted to ask you, I kind of should have slipped back here a little bit, but when we're talking about choosing material and, and writers, you know, we had Glenn Campbell had a great uh-huh. working relationship with Jimmy Webb back in the 60s. Uh, you worked a little bit with uh, Hal David and Burt Bacharach. What, was there a, a favorite songwriter for you, or was it, uh, how did you how did you choose your material, BJ? Well, of course, you know, that uh, Jimmy Webb, uh, I've, I've done some of his stuff. and mm-hmm. my, You know, I, I, I think I, I'm, I would have to be partial to uh, Mark James, who wrote uh, New York New York Woman mm-hmm. Hooked on a Feeling? Of course, he's the same guy who wrote Suspicious Minds. Sure. He's a great writer, and that we were child, we grew up together. But uh, you know, the, probably at the top of my list would have to be uh, Burt Bacharach as a composer and Hal David as a writer. And uh, that was a great team, and no no one played the piano like like Burt Bacharach. And there was just something very unique about that Bacharach David stuff. So they would have to be on the top of my list. But of course, Jimmy Webb and those guys are great too. And BJ, of course, with all of your years of success and performing and touring, I'm sure that there are some folks that you've worked alongside and people who you just kind of like to hang out with who just happen to be performers. Who would kind of be at the top of your list of favorites to just hang out with? Oh uh, well, my best my best friend uh, is a guy named Billy Joe Royal. Oh sure, uh, who had the, who had down in the boondocks, and we worked together a lot. Uh, actually, in a couple, in a few weeks, we're going to go out on a and do three or four nights together. But uh, he's, he's my buddy, and I work with him a lot. Uh, um, so I'm, uh, I always look forward to being with him. And another guy I'm sure that you look forward to is the guy you'll be performing with on Friday the 13th at the Tulip Time Festival in Holland. That, of course, is Gary Puckett. Oh, of course. I, I meant to mention him, too. Yeah, Gary's a great guy, and we do, we work together, uh, you know, quite often. And uh and I'm looking forward to being seeing him again. Of course, you guys are exactly the same age. You were born only about two months apart, and they'll be together at the Central Wesleyan Auditorium Tulip Time Festival, Friday the 13th. And I know John and I will certainly be there, BJ. We can't wait to hear that uh, exciting twin bill. Well, man, we're looking forward to, to being there. And, uh, you know, I just appreciate you guys talking to me. Thanks for playing my records all these years, and uh, I'll see all my fans on the Friday the 13th. That's very kind of you. I hope you know how much of a thrill this has been for us. Oh, You've been a big part of our musical library for our entire lives, and we are huge fans and can't wait to see you in person. That's right. Well, Rick, I appreciate that. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rick. And uh, I look forward to meeting you guys. All, All right. right. We'll see you Friday. Thanks, BJ. <laughs> I'll be in New York City.